times over. I tried to avoid the second time over, but uh, I couldn't uh, influence the course of events. So yeah. BHO, the unauthorized. Did you bring me to sell? Uh, Did you have any to sell? I have about three of them. Oh, good. Let's uh, look at this one packet, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just not a grenade. It's not a grenade.
situation. So, what I think is necessary is to recognize, first of all, that what you have right now is not the New Deal. This is the New Deal in reverse. The New Deal was what? Payments to individuals. The Social Security Act. An unemployment check if you're out of a job. A welfare check if you're destitute. A check if you're crippled and maimed and unable to work. That's the Social Security Act. A loan to get a house. A loan to start a business. That's the GI Bill of Rights. Something to stop foreclosures. We've heard nothing about this. We've heard the opposite of it. There were even proposals last year that the Obama team decided that they did not like. With Austin Goolsbee of the University of Chicago and Skull and Bones making economic policy. So there's nothing like the Homeowners Loan Corporation. There's nothing like, above all, what we would need right now. Federal relief. 2.6 million jobs lost. Real unemployment, approximately 20%. When Roosevelt took office, about 25%. Right now, in my estimation, 20%. The state of Michigan, one person out of every eight, is on food stamps. In the state of California, as of February 1st, 10 days from now, welfare checks will not go out. Now, I invite you to contemplate what that means. Welfare is gone. Welfare was destroyed by the last golden boy of the Democratic Party, Bill Clinton, to assure his second election. It's the worst thing he ever did. Welfare as we knew it, which was a title of the Social Security Act of 1935, it's gone. Now there's something called TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. I assure you that to get on TANF, you have got to have one foot in the grave. If you're on TANF, you are hurting. You are in bad shape. Now under the liberal Republican Schwarzenegger, allied to the Kennedy family, which is also behind the new regime, the state of California has said that they will not send out welfare checks as of February 1st. Now that means that within one week, ten days, two weeks, the first deaths will occur. Among the destitute, among the old, the sick, the women, the children, the defenseless, and so forth. Somehow their plight got lost today. I didn't hear a word about them in that speech. I didn't hear anything about Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which was the masterpiece of Harry Hopkins, right? the guy who had come from, from dealing with poverty and destitution in, in New York State. You don't have any of that. What we had last week was President-elect Obama had, of course, been the prime mover behind the approval of the first round of the bailout, the so-called TARP. And whenever I hear this, I feel like it's a personal insult to myself that they've got, they decided to do this in order to, to, uh, to give me a hard time. This guy character on there, that's right wing around my name, and that's called the TARP. So, in order to get the first round, and remember, the first round of the TARP was defeated in the House of Representatives by a combination of good old reactionary Republicans and some New Deal Democrats. The second time around, President-elect Obama called the Black Caucus and twisted arms to get them to vote for $350 billion for the Wall Street derivatives bubble that nobody could have ever gotten for WIC or Head Start or food stamps or unemployment benefits or any of the other things that were needed. And now last week, he did it again. Whoops, he did it again. Mm. Even though the first round of the TARP has been a complete failure, we now had Obama for the second round of the TARP making a series of calls to various congressional leaders saying, don't make me use my veto. Don't embarrass me at the beginning of my wonderful new regime. We're going to have unicorns and rainbows and singing tomorrow, so you vote for the TARP. And that money was approved last week. And in the dead of night, $30 billion was given to Bank of America. Here, not with a subprime mortgage crisis. It is a world economic and financial depression of unimaginable, unfathomable proportions. It is a genocidal event in itself. It brings with it genocide. If there were 40,000 people dying every day in the third world two years ago, I'm sure it's double that today. Nobody knows because there are no statistics that fast. At the heart of the bubble, 1.5 quadrillion of derivatives. Derivatives, yes, derivatives. The, the type of work, they talk about toxic assets, these complex instruments. 
poisonous paper, whatever they call it. It means derivatives. It means structured investment vehicles, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, auction rate securities, on and on and on. All of them paper based on paper. Paper based on paper. That's what a derivative is. The only approach to 1.5 quadrillion is not how do you feed it. How do you destroy it? My proposal, delete. Hit the delete key. Shred it. For the holidays, I recommended Bonfire and Yule Log with the derivatives. <laughs> we can have the, no, the maypole of the derivatives. The, the derivatives have got to be wiped out. There is no end to this. How can you bail out 1.5 thousand trillion, 1.5 quadrillion of derivatives with these small sums that don't even get up to a trillion? Right? 700 billion. It can't be done. What I do know is that the 30 billion that was given to Bank of America, which will be burned through within about six hours of derivatives losses, given to the state of California, would have saved lives. And that is what I think we have to, we have to fight for. In other words, this administration, this new regime, is the most concentrated version of Wall Street power I have ever seen in my life. And we've got to begin to fight them immediately, because we are now, as of tomorrow, in the 100 days to something that looks very much like the Mussolini fascist corporate state. That is the goal. Now, the, the first round of the talk was completely squandered. The second round, or to be immediately seized, clawed back from Bank of America and given to the states. Every state has a budget crisis. California is 50 billion, New York not far behind. You go through it all, add it all up, you'll get close to the 350 billion. Not one penny for Wall Street banks. Those banks are all, they're all bankrupt. If you watch the television today, the whole market went down 4%, but J.P. Morgan Chase and Citibank went down 20% in one day. 20%. Now, Citibank has been bailed out twice. Once with the original talk, once with a special bailout. Now they want a third bailout. The other one, of course, J.P. Morgan Chase, the flagship of the entire operation. They'll, they'll be getting their second round of the bailout, but it won't work. J.P. Morgan is the biggest derivatives monster in the world. Their derivatives amount, in my estimation, to 300 to 400 trillion dollars. Remember, the gross national product of the United States, 15 trillion. A lot of that is hot air, too. But just to get an idea, say it's 300 trillion, it's 20 times the gross national product of the United States in just derivatives at J.P. Morgan Chase. So that's where the money should go. That is not where the money will go. If you saw the Washington Post on Friday, the headline, Obama Promises Entitlement Reform. I recommend that you read this article. It is absolutely essential. It is an article where he talks about the fact that his new slogans are no longer hope and change, but they're what we knew all along. His slogans are responsibility, duty, and sacrifice. Sacrifice. I didn't hear sacrifice in the election campaign. Now I hear it when he talks to the Washington Post editorial board. And the area of sacrifice that he's going to have is what he calls the entitlements. That means your economic rights that were fought for by the labor movement and by all sorts of people in this country and were then gotten, they were ran through the Congress and so forth with the help of Roosevelt during the New Deal. He wants to take those away. He wants to take them away. So what's going to happen is the looting, the sacking, and the pillaging of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And where will that money go? You think it's going to go to the poor? You think it's going to go to the destitute and the welfare checks of California? No, no, no. It's going to go to the people who own this regime. And they have names. Soros, David Rockefeller, Goldman Sachs. That's what you've got. You've got a banker's dictatorship. The Republican Party, of course, is also a party of Wall Street, but it's got a large element of low-wage southern sweatshop employers who don't want to be taxed for Wall Street. That's where you see this interesting resistance that comes out of the Republican Party. It's always wrong-headed. It's always destructive. It's reactionary. It's based on the Austrian school. Oh, my God. But even there, they don't go along with Wall Street as much as what we've got right now. I can go through the cabinet for you and tell you which banks own them. Obama, as I said, it's clear. Soros, Goldman Sachs, David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission. Biden, 
is owned by NBNA Bank of Delaware. It's a credit card gouging operation. If you have one of their cards, they have the highest rates, the most draconian penalties, and so forth. The Secretary of the Treasury, the most important job in the present time, Geithner, is owned by the Goldman Sachs Citibank clique. And that same Goldman Sachs Citibank clique that was clustered around Rubin includes Larry Summers, the economic czar in the White House, the man, of course, who thinks that women are genetically inferior and can't do science, but he thinks he can. He's the president of Harvard who talked like a gangster. Remember him? And then you've also got Paul Adolph Volcker. Really somebody, it's like bringing back, it's like bringing back Robert McNamara or some genocidalist of the past to the Pentagon. This was the guy with the 23% crime rate who destroyed the U.S. industrial base back under Jimmy Carter and opened the door to the long reactionary nightmare of Reagan, Reagan, and Bush. So this is what you have. And the words that Obama used to the Washington Post editorial board were, and let's see if you remember this, he said, I'm going to use my political capital to get entitlement reform done. Now that phrase about political capital, does that ring a bell to anybody? That's exactly what Bush said when he was elected. So hope and change turned out to be the same despicable program of looting and pillaging and sacking people that we had tried under right-wing auspices. The neocon right-wing cover crew tried it. They didn't succeed. Now we have a one-party dictatorship, and they're going to do it to you under left cover. And they're going to say, it's the wonderful feeling of joining together in sacrifice, that the living standard has been too high. You've all been much too greedy. You've been selfish pigs. Think about those people in Africa. Think about the polar bears. Think about global warming, and therefore, sign away your economic rights, because you've already signed them away. So I think this is a, this is a terrible situation. Now, just in terms of the, uh, the economics, I think that's sort of it. It's, it's going to be the Wall Street dictatorship. And the simple idea is they will flay you alive. Obama will flay you alive and convoy that money into the Wall Street derivatives bubble. It will be futile, and it will never end. And the only way out of this is to fight it. So hope and change have been replaced by responsibility, duty, and uh, sacrifice. sacrifice. Now, in terms of the, uh, the foreign policy, you, you of course remember that Obama was the most bellicose of all candidates. He was the only one that I can see who ran on the explicit platform of wanting to bomb a country, and not just any country. He wanted to bomb Pakistan with 160 million people, nuclear weapons, and some medium-range missiles that can deliver them. A very large Islamic country. He demanded that in Chicago in July of 2007. You remember Senator Clinton said, oh no, that's too much. McCain said, oh no, that's too much. Even Bush said, that's too much. But that policy has now been implemented because, of course, this was not the shifting of power here today. The real power shift occurred about a year ago when Bush, Cheney, and the neocons were put out to pasture and were set to doing photo opportunities with grade school classes. And the power went into the hands of the principals committee, meaning Gates, meaning Rice, meaning Mullen, and, of course, Hanky Panky Paulson of Goldman Sachs and, uh, and now the Treasury. Continuous bombing of Pakistan. If you're upset about Gaza, you have good reason to be upset about Gaza. You should be more upset about the fact that the U.S. has killed more people in northwest Pakistan in the past six months than the Israelis have killed in Gaza. They bomb, you know, don't, don't accept any uh, wedding invitations in northwest Pakistan because they're going to come and bomb you and blow you up because any, any concentration of peaceful people, they come in and blow up. The second one is the people in Sudan are getting ready to be attacked. Sudan is the biggest country in Africa, and uh, they happen to send China 6 or 7% of the oil that the lamps of China require. And the Anglo-Americans are determined to cut that off. So they want to invade Sudan under the human rights cover, humanitarian cover, not bin Laden, not Al-Qaeda, that's passe. They've got to bomb it under humanitarian cover. That is the personal obsession of the new Dr. Rice in the land of hope and change. We had the Dr. Rice of the previous regime, now you've got the new one, Dr. Susan Rice, 
her big project in life is to bomb the hell out of Khartoum and Omdurman and those other cities. Let me speak to all imperialists. Armies that go into Sudan have a way of not coming back. Have you seen that interesting movie where Charlton Heston gets himself killed when the Nile comes together or it splits? Uh, that's what you can expect over there. And finally, confrontation with Russia. Uh, the fact that we just had the Ukrainian gas crisis, the fact that we just had uh, Georgia attacking Russia in the summer, this is a sign of the times. The foreign policy, of course, is dominated by Zbigniew Brzezinski, as I've said now for a year. Why do I say this? Look at Robert Gates at the Pentagon. He was so dirty, he couldn't get to the head of the CIA under Bush the Elder. He is a dirty fellow. He was Bush's uh, well, you know, the deputy uh, director of the CIA, but above all, he was Brzezinski's office boy in the National Security Council, 1977 to 1981. The first guy's big saw in the morning, the last guy's big saw in the afternoon. Both of them share fanatical hatred of Russia. Gates is a Sovietologist, just like the ex-Dr. Rice, the Dr. Rice of the old regime. So now what do we have? Gates was part of the operation to overthrow the Shah. Overthrow the Shah. Maybe that was okay. But to bring in Khomeini, no. And that's what they did. They were also part of the operation to have the hostages taken. Why did they want the hostages taken? So they could have a pretext for sending modern weapons to Iran. Why did they do that? Because they wanted Iran to use those modern weapons against Iraq. Russia. Yeah. And Iraq too. But mainly Russia. Russia was the hope. Iraq was the way it, it, it turned out. And Brzezinski, of course was the guy who orchestrated that one. There's also the question of the October surprise, delaying the release of the hostages so it wouldn't help Carter. Gates, up to his neck in that. So much so that the Soviet government informed our dear friend Lee Hamilton, right, our Sherlock Holmes of all the investigations, the Soviet government informed Lee Hamilton, look at your man Gates, he was up to his neck in the October surprise. Iran-Contra, we've already said it, Arms for hostages, gun running, drug running, Robert Gates, and Robert Gates is the founder of Al-Qaeda, the creator of the Arab Legion of the CIA to go and kill the Soviets in Afghanistan. He is a Brzezinski man, he is a Brzezinskiite, and he's going to carry out the Brzezinski policy, which focuses, it basically says, look, the Middle East is a sideshow, it's an important sideshow, but it's a sideshow. The center of the world is principally Europe, Eastern Europe, and to some extent, Northeast Asia, China, Korea, Japan. That's where the world is decided. And above all, Russia and China are the two main powers in the world. You've got to deal with them. You've got to destroy them. The best way to destroy them is to play one against the other. But if you can't do that, then use other countries. Brzezinski says, I'm the guy who destroyed the Soviet Union, playing Afghanistan. I'm the guy who destroyed the Warsaw Pact with the Velvet Revolutions, and I can be now the one who destroys Russia. To partition Russia, to cut Russia into five or six mini-states, detach Siberia, and all this other stuff. This is the road of Napoleon and of Hitler. Millions and millions of deaths on that road. Now, Brzezinski says, yeah, but we won't have to go. We'll get somebody else to do it for us. I really doubt it. So the project of this administration, take my word for it, is World War III in a very sinister form. Now, one last point. <coughs> I urge you to study the young Mussolini. Uh, that's what I've been studying for the past 12 months. The young Mussolini between 1919 and 1922, by now 1925, you've got to follow him past the March on Rome. Mussolini, of course, was a revolutionary socialist. He was a, he was a real leftist. I mean, for a while, he was the real thing. Uh, so much so that Lenin praised him as being the best revolutionary socialist in the whole Italian scene. When he founded fascism, who did he have? Did he have a bunch of um, you know, right-wing uh, bankers or something? No. It was extreme left-wing anarcho-syndicalist trade union leaders, people a little bit like Andy Stern and so Hilda Solis of the new regime, a bunch of disgruntled war veterans from the special forces, those were the ones with the black shirts, the creative class. He had the best writer, the best painter, the best sculptor, and the best architect in Italy, all fascists. So the presence of the creative class, I'm afraid, guarantees Zippo. And he also had 
other revolutionary socialists like himself. Now, the thing that, that Mussolini did when he came into power was to found something called Milizia Volontaria per la Sicurezza Nazionale, a national militia for security, national volunteer security militia, translated into our lingo of today, Homeland Security Corps. Get it? Yeah. We're going to have the Green Corps. The Green Corps will say, you are an enemy of the state or of the revolution. You have a big carbon footprint. The Green Corps is going to come and visit your house and burn you out and lynch you if they can find you. Above all, the Classroom Corps. The Classroom Corps will be scab laborers to bust the teachers' union. The Senior Corps will be scab laborers to bust anybody who comes along. And then we'll have the Homeland Security Corps, and then we'll have the other volunteer organizations. And I don't, I don't say this lightly. Out of this volunteer militia came something called OVRA. OVRA was the Voluntary Committee for the Repression of Anti-Fascism, which was a secret police. And when the Nazis came into power, Heinrich Himmler and people like this came to Italy to study the OVRA. The OVRA was the model for the Gestapo. So this gets to be very, very ugly stuff very, very quickly. We have to look now at institutional transformations. Here are a couple. One is to create these militias, volunteer organizations. Yesterday, the big brouhaha yesterday was everybody has to volunteer. Yeah, wait a minute. Did David Rockefeller volunteer? Did Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase? How about Blank Fine over at Goldman Sachs? Did he volunteer? I don't see them volunteering. This is corporatism. This basically says, yeah, well, we have the mystical unity of the nation and we're all in one boat. No. What we need is class struggle. We need class struggle. Anybody who doesn't understand that there's a difference between a Wall Street finance oligarch and you, you're a fool. There's nothing I can do for you at this point, if that is not very, very obvious. Now, why class struggle? I don't mean communism. In other words, there's no point in, you know, wiping them all out. You can't do it. And even if you could, oligarchy would grow up anyway. That's what you learn from, from the story of communism, is that if you try to mow them down, oligarchy will come back in through the back door. We know that as long as there are human beings, there will be the one, the few, and the many. Mm -hmm. So there will always be the few. The question is, what are your institutional safeguards against the few? Often, a real president and a mass mobilization is a way to keep the oligarchs in the middle under the gun. But right now, we have the opposite. We have the oligarchs that have taken over the whole thing. The president is a puppet, and the people are duped, confused, intimidated, and don't know what they're doing. So, class struggle is what I recommend against all of that. There is no community of interest. Because what you want to do is redress a situation that has gotten tremendously out of kilter. Now, two more points. Labor. What's with labor? Uh, I think the, uh, the goal of this administration is to finally destroy the U.S. labor movement permanently. And I say this for two reasons. Let's look at the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. What's his background? He's a union buster. We have Michelle Rhee. I hope people follow Michelle Rhee here in the District of Columbia. She is a foundation-funded operative. She gets money from Bill and Melinda Gates, the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, the Dell Foundation, and other foundations. These are not charitable and philanthropic organizations. Their goal is to perpetuate ruling class domination. In other words, the... the what am, I, I'm also somebody who's coming out of the left, and I've been expelled out of socialist parties for being too heretical, for being too, I don't know, trying to hybrid, hybridize the left with elements of capitalism. And I don't know if this makes me a sellout or if, I have, if I'm now to the right of socialists. Um, but I don't really care because the economy is falling apart and we need to do something. So what I've done is like I've created this article and I've talked it out with people. And a lot of people don't like it, and some people do like it. Um, but here's how it would work, okay? It would be a hybrid of a commercial venture capital fund that invests in companies and expects a return. But in, in this case, it would also be a hybrid of left values of solidarity, community-oriented, community focus, uh, environmentalism, like I said. So... <clears throat> This is the solution that kills two problems with one stone. We do have a global warming problem in this country. We do have other forms of environmental degradation. Uh, the, the, um, I can 
go on about the environment and the, the, the myriad of problems that we're experiencing. But we also have problems with unemployment. So if we had this fund, it would actually help the unemployment problem and help the environmental problem at the same time. Here's how it would work. This fund would invest capital, a major amount, let's say two or three million, in an entity that qualifies, that meets the criteria, public interest, environmental effect, um, employment of people. And let's say one out of three of these entities become successful and they grow. And either through their sales and cash flow, or maybe they're acquired by another company, or they even go public on the stock market, they grow fast and are able in three or four years to return, to create a big return on investment. This is the way commercial venture capital works. They invest in a number of companies, and a percentage of those companies return. But they return in this explosive way um, because of growth and, and uh, valuation <clears throat> that it more than makes up for all the different losses. Uh, in the first round of funding. So let's say two out of three of your investments fail, but that's okay, because one out of three returns and, and, and returns the capital into the fund, two or threefold. So one of the charms of this program is that what I'm suggesting is you get it started, you capitalize it, you fund it with maybe the, the federal budget of 2009 or 2010, but eventually it should become self-sustaining because it's, it's generating its own return on capital. Also, I want this thing to be decentralized. There's a lot of people out there that have uh, a mistrust of the federal government for good reason. Uh, but in this case, I'm, I'm thinking the top 600 big towns and small cities and big cities of America. That's how we organize this. We organize this at the, at the community level and so that if you live in Austin, Texas, and you have an idea for a company and, um, and it, it meets the criteria, that you go to your corner, office, which is basically like a bank or a credit union. And you go in and, and present the business plan, and maybe in a week or two you get an answer, and, and you are likely to get this funding, and uh, you know, there's certain guarantees that have to be met, and you have to make certain promises, you employ a certain amount of people. But this is direct injection of capital into the grassroots. This is not trying to salvage the already broken and cracked up and leaking all over the place financial system or the financiers. This is, um, again, it's, it's somewhat heretical because it's, it's, it's the left and the right. It's free market and it's also um, influenced by the politics of the left. And it's one of the things that people really like to talk about. But before we get into the discussion period, one of the, the third imperative, the third reason that we did this tour is to talk about 1,000% uh, changes, 1,000% change in government transparency. Not because we expect this to happen overnight, but because we need to ask for it. It's what we've already been asking for as a 9-11 truth movement. Some of you are older than I am. Some of you are part of the JFK assassination truth movement. Uh, but I'm suggesting that we need a broad call for government transparency as a way to reassert the sovereignty of the citizenship over the, the, the out-of-control federal war state so that change is made. Not just so that we have information, but that, but that the information becomes well-known and the, the moral imperative that's inside of us all uh, is awakened and we all start demanding that we know the full truth about the U.S. federal protection of the 9-11 hijackers, we know the full truth about who killed the Kennedys, who killed Martin Luther King, whose holiday we celebrated yesterday, who killed Malcolm X, uh, because all of those situations are shrouded in mystery and yet the truth is not impartial. You scratch the surface, as we've seen in 9-11, you scratch the surface and it's not like you're confronted with a myriad of theories and it's so confusing. That's what the liberals sometimes say, like, you know, oh, well, look, you know, the more we research this, the less we're going to know because there's so many theories out there. But I think we have realized that, no, that we as a movement, as a democratic, grassroots, leaderless organization, we've had a lot of dialogue, we've worked it out over time, and we've figured out that, 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 that the truth is a vibrant thing that calls us to it. And sure, we've gone off in a couple of different directions, but... As a movement, we have done something beautiful. We've, we've, we've articulated a, a, a more truthful counter-narrative. And I see a lot of hope around me. Just today on 9-11 Blogger, I read about um, the, uh, I read about probably one of the most um, uh, least likely, hello, welcome, welcome, have a seat. There's beer in the fridge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually an, uh, uh, a note of a note of hope. Um, somebody in Gator 
finish with 9-11 Truth, this Florida group happened to send the Richard Gage DVD to the assistant director of counterterrorism of the FBI, which, if you know your history of the FBI, this would be the least likely branch of the FBI to ever say anything or do anything with David Frasca and Mike Rollins, who were suppressing Colin Raleigh, you know, getting promoted into the counterterrorism of the FBI. But for some reason, and I don't know who this guy is, I can't really give you the full story here, but I have hope about this. For some reason, this associate director of counterterrorism wrote a letter to this guy down in Florida and said... Harold Sayed. What's that? Harold. Harold Sayed. We're from Florida. Okay, right. Okay, good. He wrote a letter to Harold and said, thank you for the DVD. I found it, I did watch it, I found it to be well-sourced and well-documented, and it could lead to something else. That's what he implied. And I personally feel that maybe he knows that the White House, of extreme proximity to the Saudis, to Saudi intelligence, the White House, who has been doing business with bin Laden since 1978, is now out the door. And you can say what you want about Barack Obama. I agree that we need a left critique of Barack Obama. But when Barack Obama was confronted by the guys from We Are Change, he did say, you're doing good work, and you need to keep it up. There's glimmers of hope out there that, well, let me say this. I didn't vote for Barack Obama. I'm a Green Party guy. I voted for Cynthia McCain. Yay. Yay. But if we're promised change, then it's up to us to create a mass movement that presses for that change. We can't take any promise from a Democrat at face value anymore, post-Clinton, or post-Truman, even. I can cite other Democrats that have bombed, 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 instead of answering the interests of the people. But I do know that real change comes from mass movements, right? Civil rights, women's suffrage, ending the war in Vietnam. They didn't end, Nixon didn't end the war in Vietnam because it was a good thing to do. He ended it because there was a million kids right outside of his door. And we know from the white, the Nixon tapes, how that rattled him, and how he felt that he had better end the Vietnam War, or it was going to end the rule of the U.S. ruling class in the United States of America. You know, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'm ready for questions. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe you and I 
Italian and Western should get together and uh, talk to William Pepper about uh, using the, the Hague, the national body of law. What do you think about that idea? Look, I, I think somehow you're missing the tremendous emergency that we're in. I think these, this is uh, this is many elements of unreality. In other words, there's, there's even a pathos in this idea that we're going to appeal to the new peace angel, Barky Obama, and that he is somehow going to make this stuff right. I think this is insane. I think you're dealing with no, 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 sinister. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Sinister. I'm not no, sure. I had to ask you to focus on the question. The question is, what about, we're not talking about appealing to Obama, we're talking about appealing to the international courts at, at the Hague. Look, the, the International Court of the Hague will do nothing to embarrass the new regime because everybody in Europe is gaga for Obama. Everybody who hated Bush. Look, I think Christianity has one very valuable thing. It's not good to be blinded by hate. And what I see is people are so blinded by their hatred of Bush and Cheney and neocons, which I understand. I, in some ways, I share. But not to the point that I was blinded. Not to the point that I couldn't see what was happening. And that the wheels are changing. And the, the revolving stage has revolved. Right? The, the whole stage has turned around. All of the ideological categories have been turned upside down. And uh, I've always thought that, that legal action is futile. That's my basic approach. Now, we have Phil Berg, and he has a, he has a release. And people are, I only have one copy, so I didn't, uh, I didn't have my... Uh, this is the guy who's he's, he's in the Supreme Court trying to show that Obama was born in Kenya and is a citizen of Indonesia. And he's fighting with nothing. And he's Phil Berg from the 9-11 Proof Group. He's one of the few people who has successfully made the transition from the old world right, to the new world, to the world that you've got to fight in now, from the last war to the current war. And I'm always very pessimistic about legal action because I once had to fight, I fought all the way through the U.S. legal system from the lowest level in New York State up to the U.S. Supreme Court to try to stay on the ballot when I was running for Senate in New York State in 1986. And I knew they were rotten 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. I think that's his futile. But the propaganda of what Berg has done has moved the world because Berg has gotten 150 million people come to his website. Maybe it's 200 million by now. He'll pass this one. Let's see. It's just Berg saying that he's going to keep fighting and that this is a really sad, uh, it's a sad day. It's a grim day. Um, but does that guy have any sources? Huh? Does Berg have any sources for his assertion? Of course he does. It's, I, I mean, a, I'm a biographer of myself, and I'll tell you that he's got sources. In other words, here's the simple thing. Wait, wait, wait. If wait, Obama, wait. listen, here's the source. If Obama wants to put it all to rest, bring out what is known as the vault copy of the birth certificate. It is a full, detailed birth certificate. It's, it doesn't say certificate of live birth. It says birth certificate. It says physician, time born, mother, father, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's very detailed. The original, please. You want to put this all aside? Look, if I had a website attached to you, and I got 150 million hits, and you had the document, wouldn't you say, all right, let's shut this guy up. Let's bring the document out, put it in a room, let the press come in, let them take pictures, and it's over. And the guy collapses. But and he will do it. And the point is that Obama is not qualified to be president. And of course, the reason this is important is Obama is now the president, okay? He's got to be blackmailed. In other words, what happens if he decides to do something the Wall Street guys don't want? They've got to be able to tell him, Barkey, we'll have you in jail in 72 hours. Who is qualified to be president? Huh? Who is qualified to be president? That's not the issue right now. The issue is who's... who's I think he means just like U.S. citizenship. What, what it means is you've got to be a natural born. You've got to be born in the U.S. and you've got to maintain your citizenship. And he's struck out on both of those. So... This, you can say, well, what are you, xenophobic, you hate foreigners? No, it's not this. It's that the fact that he doesn't qualify to be president makes him blackmailable. That's also the problem with Rezko, Auchi, Al Samari, Blagojevich, and Daly, is that they can indict him within 72 hours. He's up to his neck in this stuff. He has cavorted in a cesspool of corruption. Valerie Jarrett, who is sitting in the White House tonight as senior advisor, is Rezko in a skirt. Whatever Resco did, she did. Resco is now headed for the federal pen, we think. Valerie Jarrett is exactly the same person, except she's a different you know, version of the same thing. The model for this is Harry Truman. Harry Truman came out of a dirty machine. It was called the Pendergast machine 
of Kansas City, Missouri. Pendergast had been put in jail for a year. They could say to him, Harry, you do what we tell you, or you'll go the same way as your man Pendergast. You'll be in jail within 72 hours. And they could do that with Bargeman. They get him on the citizenship issue. They can get him on the Chicago stuff and probably more stuff that I don't know. You can't have a president that's blackmailable. And of course, let me mention the other one. Larry Sinclair, guy that I've gotten to know. I, I helped him when he came here to the, um, to the Democratic National Committee. His book is coming out soon. Now, this is the gay man who says that he had a homosexual encounter with Obama in 1999 with crack cocaine and all the rest. And I know him, and I think uh, this is a highly intelligent person. He was put in jail by Bo Biden, the corrupt, nepotist son of the current vice president, who threatened him with life in prison. They arrested him in the National Press Club. They took him to Delaware. They had him spend the weekend in the D.C. jail. I went to see him on Monday. He was gone. He had gone to Delaware. They threatened him with life in prison. Life in prison! For what? Not because they said, oh, you're a three-time loser. You have previous uh, convictions. You've been a con artist in the 1985, and now you've got some warrant to be hooked up. So they said, you are going to go to jail for the rest of your life after arresting him in the Temple of the First Amendment. Huh? You want to talk fascism? That sounds like fascism to me. So this is the world that we're in now. And I'm telling you, all of the stuff with 9-11 is relevant and germane, but it, the situation now of the average person is desperate beyond your belief. Can I say something? You can't go to a bread line and say to people, I want to talk to you about 9-11 right. truth. Yeah, this yeah. time is gone. And I, I believe the 9-11 truth movement has the, the main achievement that we can, we, can, uh, we can say for ourselves is that we probably contributed to stopping the attack on Iran when that was the policy. That policy has not been abandoned. The policy is now to use Iran against the Russians and to make uh, to attack Pakistan, to destroy Pakistan. So that's a real achievement. You can be proud that you, that you did that, right? That was important. But now history has moved on. And you can't stand on the same street corner repeating the same old slogan. They keep pointing to it every minute. But they don't. That's not the basis of the new regime. OK, let's try to keep it succinct. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't do what they I have say. a question. You seem very combative, and you've made a lot of points. Um, and it seems like you, you kind of figured out where we are today. Yes, You've, I've heard the word fight come out of your mouth probably 50 times tonight. Um, and that's one approach to looking at it as something we need to counter with another fight. And I don't know if that's completely uh, where we need to be and as a group talking about uh, you know, where we are as a people in this country and where the system is, or where we think it is at least. And uh, talking about those things, I think the approach maybe should be, it should be looked at a little differently. And again, I heard the word fight come out of your mouth a lot. It is what it is. We are in a, this is a current system, a regime with banksters and greedy politicians, uh, a military industrial complex gone wild. And so here we are, and we're looking at it, but I don't think, I don't think you can fight it. I think you need to embrace it and understand it completely in order to make real change. Would you agree? No, I, I absolutely no? agree. I think to embrace it. Is, is that what you're talking now is? I'm not saying I'm not. All intellectual suicide as an individual. No, so what would you do you're, to, you're to make substantive changes in our country? This. What would you do to make, what would your top three things be to make substantive changes in our country? Here's a four-point program. Okay. The four thing is comprehensive re-regulation. Wipe out derivatives, ban hedge funds, <coughs> ban adjustable rate mortgages, re-regulate the stock market, no naked shorting. I agree with you on that. that. It, it needs, yeah. All right, well, I, should, hey, I had four points here. Four That's points. financial. I'm not quite a moderator. The second so that one, let one sir have the four okay. points, all right? The second point is the big one. Nationalize the Federal Reserve. One percent or less credit for productive activity only. Production is the way out of the depression. Agricultural and industrial production, construction, uh, infrastructure building, and so forth. Start things like uh, every metropolitan area gets a modern, attractive urban mass transit system, transcontinental maglev railway for rural America. In other words, if you're concerned about carbon, let's take half the cars off the road in commuter times by building attractive, modern uh, mass transit. You've got to rebuild water systems, electrical grids, school systems, hospital. We have a 1,000 hospital deficit in the United States. The living standard in this country is down two-thirds. It's minus 60 percent from the time of Johnson. So, start a comprehensive program of brief reconstruction. The third point is federal emergency relief. 
We're going to need Federal Emergency Relief Agency, PWA, WPA, CWA, all the Harry Hopkins programs. This winter, LIHEAP, pay up uh, unemployment benefits, pay up all the food stamp programs, all the rest of this stuff. The fourth point, the Bretton Woods Conference to restart international trade on the basis of delivering high technology capital goods to the third world, in particular Africa and South Asia. That would be the main four point program to fight the depression. If you embrace the establishment at this point, you're essentially annihilating yourself and joining them in nothingness. I'd also like to respond to that, too. Yeah. There are many different styles of communication. And part of uh, the vow of nonviolence is also looking at your communication style. If you're an activist seeking to build a movement, you've got to look at what is perhaps too combative or too violent a communication style. Um, there's a really good uh, West Coast academic named Piensa Venya who, is, who writes lucidly about Hegel. And he says that Hegel's logic invites us to get away from the Aristotelian argument styles, which are all about A against B. And Piensa Venya asks us, through Hegel, to embrace a Hegelian style of understanding the way intellectual confrontations can happen and could happen. And he says it's the, the opposite of an Aristotelian, which I, I would say which model of militarist conflict example. Or, the Hegelian style is to, instead of be against your opponent and be just trying to defeat your opponent, or like Lenin said, Lenin said, we must destroy them utterly, you know, mm -hmm. true Hegelian style is to see your opponent's argument as simply the underdeveloped version of your own. So it's, we're all developing, and we're all going through, you know, trying to hybridize and absorb different influences and grow. So it's a little bit more empathetic to try to, instead of see, Gandhi said, we have to stop seeing the other as our enemy. You know, this was really radical. Because if you see the, the opposition as an enemy, you dehumanize them. But Gandhi tried to say we can actually create faster, real social change by realizing that the so-called enemy is just really this underdeveloped person. That their argument is the underdeveloped version of our own. And if you get away from stereotyping, if you get away from hate, like you, like you mentioned, Webster, um, and it opens up the possibilities. It opens up more revolutionary possibilities because Gandhi and King showed that you can actually change things with the media exposure, with um, the cops suddenly refusing to turn hoses and dogs on protesters. You can actually melt the heart of this person that you used to demonize as your enemy. So a little bit of Hegel, a little bit of Gandhi, I think, Yes. Can I add something to what you just said? Sure. I think if we focus on more of fighting terrorism to embracing peace, or fighting war instead of saying something negative, you know, because when you say something and you think it really affects the energy of the whole universe, and I think instead of saying fighting, you know, like um, racism, it's Say something positive. Like, yeah. if in, instead of going to anti war movement, go to a peace movement. Right? And, right. you know, uh, right. Mary Teresa said that. She said, I would not go to an anti war movement, but I would go to a peace movement. Right. So start to think more what you want, more positive than more defeat, fight, you know, right. all this. Yeah, right. all these word, negative words use more positive words like embrace freedom and yeah. peace and all this. Yeah, and I find myself in a really contradictory position, but I, I like it anyway. Being this person who's, you know, with this alternate article and this idea about the social venture fund, it's an experiment. You know, Gandhi said, engage in experiments in peace and truth and don't be married to the outcomes. You don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out. I can't right. control the future. Nobody can. So just engage, engage in experiments, a piece of truth, and be open to however it's going to work out. So this thing about green venture capital or social capital is an experiment. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I find myself actually now not having to see the, the Geichners and the Paul Adolf Wolfers as my enemy, and I'm actually
actually, you know, I'm somebody who's not a four foundation baby because I run a company. I run a fair trade, a good company. It's all about community empowerment and coffee and author events and live events. But it's a for-profit company, too. So I'm, like, trying to be a good progressive in some ways who can also take this economic proposal and say, like, you know, how evil are you guys really in the Democratic Party? Isn't this something that we could work with, you know? And I know you're cackling over here, and I know it's very evil. I'm sorry to say, I think Mia should be introduced professionally because she's a great person and she's done a lot. And she's here from her hometown in Tampa. That's right. Mia drove up to Tampa. Yeah. Yeah. Would it not be possible for us to create a new entity that would replace the corporation and that people would feel comfortable investing in, that instead of having profit as the primary motive, would have some other primary motive, like social justice or... Yeah, you're totally right. You know what I mean? There already is a movement growing called social venture resources, social SRI, socially responsible investing. And there's already mutual funds that are dedicated, you know, whether or not they're all investing in SRI is up for a topic of debate, and they're definitely up for criticism. But there's a huge shift going on. I mean, overall, in terms of megatrends or even in terms of, like, if you study the astrological calendar, there's a gigantic shift going on, and we are entering a new kind of time, a new kind of eon. I mean, you see it from the differences between the pre-baby boomer generation and the baby boomer generation. You see it in the vast differences between that generation and my generation. We're getting more and more into equality and egalitarianism and communal care for each other and care for the planet. And so out of that, that's expressed through economics, of course, too. So there is an industry now for socially responsible investment. That means there are entrepreneurs who focus on what's called triple bottom line. Like you said, in business, in triple bottom line businesses, it is about profit, but the bottom line is shared. It's not just about profit. It's also about the planet and about the people that you work with and who work for you. So that's triple bottom line. Hello. There's food over here and there's beer in the fridge. Yeah. I'd like to thank the semantic question about the legal system, because I feel like Bush and Cheney and all these people have done things that are horrible. They've murdered people, they've caused the death of many people. And do we now just forget it? They're out? I mean, hopefully maybe later they'll get taken care of? I mean, there's no statute of limitations on murder. And, you know, this is one of the things I feel like the Nile of the Truth movement has worked towards, which is to get these people to be held accountable for their crimes. Well, you're both going to love this. My new book proposal about 9-11 is called The Indictment. And I've got an agent in New York who can't decide whether or not she likes it or not. It's got to be a mass movement. It's got to be pressure from a lot of people. That's what I'm interested in. It's what's the tactic to get this mass movement going. Because he's saying it's an emergency. And we're all talking about a mass movement. Let me try to just say two more things. Really, another great book is Elizabeth Taylor Vega's book, USA vs. Bush. And then Vincent Bugliosi just did a book about how to prosecute Bush. So getting away from the mass movement question, which is kind of a little bit based on a future moment, I think the tactic about using the courts is a great point. Because all you really need is a Jim Garrison prosecutor. Remember Jim Garrison and the JFK assassination? He was pretty successful. Maybe not immediately, but he did use the courts. He did get somewhere. And the film about him 30 years later did affect legal change and opened up the files. And it was denounced by the Washington Post before it was even out. The problem with all of this stuff is it seems to be hard for people to grasp that you have a new enemy, more of a warmonger, an exterminating angel of austerity on the home front. 
He's the most dangerous imperialist you've ever seen. He's got whole dimensions of left-wing demagogy and left-wing credibility that Bush and Cheney had no hope of having. He's got a following of fanatics, which Bush and Cheney never really had, not in the, in the sense that we, that we see it today. You have a new enemy. You have a new, deadly, combative, brutal enemy in the House. Obviously, the historical record, well, I think the historical record is more or less there. I mean, I, I tried to contribute to this myself. I think it would be a grave mistake to say that Bush and Cheney are the two people involved. You'd want to include them. But you're going to leave untouched that transversal network that's going to come. Where do you think the next false flag is going to come from? I'll give you an example. David Broder writes in the Washington Post. He says, the crime the, 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 where Bush and Cheney fell short is that they didn't use 9-11 to cut the standard of living and to, in, and to impose brutal austerity on the American people. We could have done it, he says. But Bush said to people, go to the shopping center and buy yourself something nice. The ruling class is furious. Their attack against Bush and Cheney is fundamentally from the right. They're saying Bush and Cheney were not reactionary enough. They didn't kill enough. They could have killed more on the home front than they killed. They could have taken a slice out of Social Security right in the wake of 9-11. Bush could have said, let's reform Social Security right after 9-11, and that way we'll, we'll pay for the war. And they didn't do that. Now, the door to false flag is opening again. It's open wide as of today. The, uh, Andrew Sullivan of the, of the Atlantic Monthly wrote last uh, December, a year ago, December, we can't do any false flags anymore because now we have Bush and Cheney. Nobody believes them. We need to have new false flags. We need a credible president. Now they have them. They now have a president who can go on television and say, a bomb went off, it was country X. And they think that the world will believe it. I doubt it. But they believe that the world will now will go along with this. And based on what I see from David Broder, they can think of a false flag event with the main purpose being to crush resistance inside the US in terms of labor movement and anybody who would fight austerity, the nurses unions, the teachers unions, the UAW, and people like this. And I think that is now very, very, very much there. Now, just remember, on October 19th, and if you don't know this, you should kick yourself in public. On October 19th, in Seattle, Joe Biden told what the scenario of the new regime is going to be. He said, within six months, we will have an international confrontation, which will be generated, and the righteousness of the U.S. position will not be immediately evident. And then he said, within 12 months, our regime will be hated because our economics will be sound, we will do the right thing, but it won't be popular. That means genocidal austerity against the American people. The genocide that you've seen in the world is now coming home big time. Yeah. Not just you know, retail austerity. I'm talking massive wholesale austerity. If those California welfare checks don't go out, and right now nobody seems to care, nobody cared down the other day, people are going to start dying like flies. And at that point, all of these process questions and all the matters of, of historical justice and looking back to Bush and Cheney, I would say to you, if, you're, if your targets are Bush and Cheney right now, you're spinning your wheels. You have a new enemy. You've got to face this. And if I'm too vehement, I'm sorry, that's just my style. I see a real emergency. And I see a lot of people who ought to be fighting. And I see, by the way, the libertarians, right, the Austrians in our group, they'll say, oh, and we have a guy on the, on the list who says this stuff. He says, yeah, uh, so some Mexicans will die in California. What do I care, says this guy. That's a Nuremberg crime. You can hang at Nuremberg for being a party to genocide in that sense. I have a question for you. <coughs> Somebody smoke? I have a question for you. All right. Okay. Well, I think I have a question for you. Of command, except that the top of the chain of command 
At that point, they said no. And the reason they said no is that power was already shown, right? Because power was in the hands of who? Of Gates. So Gates says, I don't want those cruise missiles used against Iran. I'm saving them for Russia. I want them used against Russia. I don't want to bomb Iran. I want to play Iran against Russia. And my second question is about Iran. Iran supposed to be converted to the petrol system. How does Iran? Iran, yeah. Uh, I've been uh, reading some um, information about Iran supposed to convert to the petrol system of this Iran. Order. Yes, that's a, that's. So we back in time. Look, the dollar is in is in free fall. I mean, the dollar is anybody knows it. The dollar is actually being held up by the fact that Europe is collapsing faster than the U.S. right now. So the the euro has been has been going down compared to the dollar. But the principal idea with Iran is, Brzezinski's track record is what? Brzezinski's track record is to deliver modern weapons to Iran. What could it mean? It means delivering atomic bombs to Iran. That the U.S. ships atomic bombs and missiles to Iran. Biden has already told the Israelis, this was from Haaretz, Biden says to the Israelis, dear Israelis, there's going to be a nuclear Iran and you're going to like it. You're going to sit still and you're going to do zippo, nada. You can go and kill some Palestinians for, for election purposes, but you're not going to lay a glove on Iran, because that's the new Anglo-American policy. And I believe it is. But they'll try to, they'll go to the Iranians and say, we have some nuclear missiles. You want some? They're special. They only go to Moscow. You want some? And then they'll say, you, you need a nuclear navy in the Caspian Sea. I do look at the map, there's the Caspian Sea and Baku. They'll say, those Russians are stealing more oil. Why don't you start fighting the Russians in the Caspian Sea? And here we'll give you a nice nuclear navy in the Caspian Sea. So we'll open up a real flank, a, a, a big uh, you know, attack into the soft underbelly of Holy Mother Russia and surrounding states. I think that's the new policy. I think the idea, bomb Pakistan and talk to Iran is the policy. Bomb Pakistan because it's a Chinese ally, it's an energy corridor for China, and talk to Iran because you want to use them against Russia. Great. Any other questions, comments? I'd like to say to my new enemy, you got to remember the 92 is, is when Clinton came in, it's all this hope, and yet he did Oklahoma City, killed 186 people, right? Me and Arkansas trapped drugs in and put more African Americans in jail than any other president. Waco. Waco. I mean, you talk, well, she was talking about, you know, don't forget 9 11. Let's not forget any of the crimes of the past and the false light events. Because I think when you look at a bigger picture, that we as members of the truth movement need to once and for all educate the people of the world that false light has been used against them. But we can expose any of them, then the whole, the whole thing gets exposed. And then they'll never again. We'll cross over that point in history that they'll never be able to use false flags against, against the people of the world. Uh, I, I agree with all the things you've done, Ron. Oh, hello, hello. Uh, so we've been talking about all this. Uh, I've got it all outlined in a quote. Does Why everybody know who you are? Ron, no. Why don't you, this is a very important person. This is Ron Fisher well, well, from the well, Independent well. Green Party here in Virginia. Uh, he ran for Congress against Congressman Moran otherwise known as Congressman Moron. He's part of a party, Gail, I call her, Gail Gale. Uh, she ran for Senate in 2006 and got, what, 40,000, 50,000 votes? She did quite a lot of votes. And this is a different kind of green. This is the kind of green that I like because they want to have urban mass transit. It's fast rail, maglev rail. And Ron is a captain from the Navy. He ran nuclear submarines. He, and he ran shipyards, the shipyard builder, and he's, the, the Act Independent website is proposing him as car czar. In other words, the new president of General Motors, Ford and Chrysler, should be Ron Fisher, Captain Ron Fisher, who's an industrial engineer, he's an engineer from, from Annapolis. But here we go, Louis, he's a very important guy. Thank you, Ron. Well, I'm anxious, I've got a website, wethepeoplenow.org. It's got a, a plan on there saying the same thing. I've got a lot of stuff in there, but nationalizing. The question is, how do we do it? What we have is a, a Congress that just isn't functional. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're giving away this money like it's going out of style. But, but, think, but what can we do to get those things done? Well, I'm sure the nationalizing the Fed. That would do what you're saying. Nationalize the Fed, give the money, have them get the money out to 
to the entrepreneurs. Go ahead. Look, there are two schools that are represented, two schools of economics that have political representation. The monetarists are everywhere. The Republicans are all monetarists. Ron Paul is a monetarist. And a whole bunch of people who I think could be doing much better. And now you've got the Malthusians who are in power. Now, where does this go back to? In the British East India Company in 1820, Ricardo was on the board of directors. He's the founder of monetarism. Malthus ran the, uh, the education school, the Hemingbury Academy, for their management, the management school. So we've got the two, the two chiefs of the British East India Company. The alternative to this is something called the American system. It's Hamilton, Lincoln, Franklin D. Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy. There's something called the American system. Most of you don't know. But there's the American system. There is. And it's the most successful, really the only successful school of development economics in the world. And what we've got to do, and this is my positive point, I hope it's clear, we must constitute a political force that argues and campaigns and fights for the New Deal approach to economics. Because what you've got is the opposite of the New Deal. It's not, it's not Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's the opposite of Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's Franklin D. Roosevelt turned upside down in true Hegelian manner. So a New Deal alternative to these two bankrupt forms. And other than that, I think the future, the future of human civilization in North America is pretty grim. So I urge people, it's time to gear up New Deal economics and try to find ways to express that politically. Stop Obama in the 100 days, and then prepare for congressional campaigns and, and to try to have some kind of an insurgency, because the, the austerity and sacrifice, if Obama really means to destroy Social Security and Medicare, he will have destroyed the Democratic Party, because that's the only thing keeping them together. And at that point, there's going to be an opening for something new. And naturally, that's a grim perspective, but that's the only one I have that's the only thing I have to offer, is fighting, and desperate fighting at that. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand where you are. Well, I'm personally curious, because you don't identify as a member of any one political third party anymore, and it doesn't seem like you're really starting the party that you envision. You've got to have, a, you've got to have ideas first. You've got to have ideas and intelligence. Right? You've got to know what's going on in the world. I mean, I've, I've, I ran for Senate quite a while ago, and I... I, I I could imagine doing it again, but this is, I don't think this is the point right now. What I think is, above all, the, the, the question is, the libertarians uh, are people who have two points that I think are absolutely valid. They say no war and no police state. The problem with the libertarians is as soon as you get into economics, they're off the charts. They're going to tell you, we want the free market. Well, if you call for the free market today, you're calling for death on a mass scale. Because the free market means J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, coming down on you like a ton of bricks. And they say, abolish the Fed. Yeah, what? Abolish the Fed? What are you going to do? Go back to Wampum? What are you going to do? Go back to uh, barter? Beads? Cowries? What's it going to do? They're talking about using debt-free money. Huh? They're just talking about using debt-free Come on. Money. Libertarianism is the Austrian school. I can give you a nice lecture on the Austrian school, but I wouldn't be allowed to. The point about the Austrian school and the Friedmanites is the Austrian school is Thatcher in practice. The Chicago school is Pinochet. So if you want a combination of Thatcher and Pinochet, go with the Austrian school and, and, and the people who, who go back to that. We've got to have a New Deal, an aggressive New Deal economic and political alternative coming out of this crisis. Otherwise, we won't come out. Next question. Okay. Um, I'm Moya, Moya Atkinson. Um, concerned about your comments about social security, Medicare, health care. I've been working with Professor Democrats of America to promote HR 676. Um, as an elderly person working with elderly people, um, I'm, I believe that there are a lot of older people who would be very disturbed at any efforts to mess around with social security. And I think our current situation proves that messing around with this would, would be disastrous when you look at the stock market. Um, so, I, and I'm sorry, I missed your first sorry. remarks, um, and so I don't quite know where you're coming from about President Obama. By the way, I just want to direct your attention to the interview with Obama in the Washington Post editorial board published on Friday. Obama promises entitlement reform. Obama says that the current levels of Social Security and Medicare are unsustainable 
and he will have a responsibility summit in February where he will use his political capital to restore sustainability. This means brutal budget cuts, it means reduction of benefits, increases in taxes, older people, uh, it's going to basically destroy Are you the about that? Okay. No, I'm, no. I'm, this was obviously good question. Good question. Good question. I, 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 it was I, obvious I, a year ago. I, wait, 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 wait. Michelle Obama talked about I, sacrifice. I, this, this scares the hell out of me to lose Social Security because I'm depending on it. But my neighbor who reads about Social Security a lot because of her, her, her job in the past says that he's planning to limit what, what richer people get, have to pay. In other words, they're not going to get as much as they're getting now. They're, look, people under the, the make less than $250,000 a year are going to still get what they get, but the people above that are going to be cut. I now, think that's I don't an know. utopia. I think no, that's but, another story. But how do you know? Where's the proof? A year ago, look, I, I, I frankly made this the business of my life for the past 12 months to follow every damn thing this character and his wife has done. Michelle Obama's stump speech, it's in my books and I urge you to read them. Her speech was sacrifice, sacrifice. We're going to have to make sacrifice. She said, don't be too happy because Barack is going to call on you to change. Obama's also responsible for the famous thing, you will not be able to eat as much as you want, you can't have your thermostat where you want, and you can't have the car you want. That was his speech in Eugene, Oregon. There's also the thing about the jobs went away, and now they're clinging bitterly to guns, religion, and anti-free trade. Anti-free trade. Principally, the idea is that Austin Goolsbee, you know, of course, Austin Goolsbee is the main advisor of the Obama campaign in terms of economics. He's a skull and bones, Chicago school monitors, and he has talked about privatizing Social Security or parts of it. So I would urge you to go into an alert. I'll propose a couple of other things for Obama, too. If he's a peace angel, let him come out and say to the Israelis, stop the bombing. Stop it. The Israeli government would collapse the bombing and stop it. More important, he should say to Russia, there will be no Polish missile crisis. We will not put missiles into Poland. That was a crazy idea of the neocons, and I'm, I'm taking it off the table. His conversation with the Polish president indicates the opposite, that he told the Polish president, Kaczynski, that the missiles would go in. So I'm afraid you've been uh, well, read down the bottom of that. I'm just talking about social security. I think you're about anything else. Medicare Advantage would be one of the areas that he did mention, which is a scam to allow independent um, people to get insurance and get a commission for it. I, I don't necessarily support Obama, but I also think that we have to be very watchful. Um, I don't know whether there is right now, I think there is enough fear in the country that there would be a certain amount of watchfulness. And I think maybe Michelle is talking about the wealthier people who should drive smaller cars and build smaller houses. I don't know why it's the, the very lowest people with the lowest income who should be so concerned because I've heard that he is talking about building, uh, creating jobs and retraining. Now, is this all just um, a I think it's, why it's, I think it's the greatest that exercise in demagogy that we've ever seen. From people like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, George Soros, David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission, including Volcker, Carter, uh, John D. Rockefeller IV, and his J. Rockefeller, all supporting him. Do you think that Goldman Sachs gives him $100 million to $200 million because they believe in hope and change and humanitarian singing tomorrow? I, I have to appeal to people. An elementary class consciousness will, I think, indicate that this person in power now, the keystone of the current regime, is a foundation operative. He's an operative of the foundation community.